Welcome everybody um, to this uh, CIPRA session 31, sponsored by the Swedish Central Bank, by Riksbank. Uh, my name is Christoph Birch, uh, and I'm chairing this session together with my colleague, uh, Chin Shang. Uh, the topic of this session is uh, bank competition and financial stability amid the rise of fintech. We look forward to three really exciting papers by uh, Manasa Gopal, Vesa Pusiainen, uh, Xavier Vives, as well as uh, uh, discussions by uh, Adrian Alter, by Xiang Li, and by Tony Arnold. The format of this session is uh, 25 minutes for the presentation, 10 minutes for the discussant, and then five minutes general discussion. Um, on Zoom, uh, the uh, panelists will have the uh, opportunity to uh, directly ask questions, whereas all the other participants uh, shall please uh, use the uh, Q&A box. Um, and uh, uh, my colleague Chin will then uh, moderate the questions and will uh, ask the uh, presenters um, uh, uh, the, uh, um, as many questions as possible, especially uh, the questions that come, most, uh, come up most often. Uh, without further ado, um, uh, I will now give um, the word to my colleague uh, Chin, who will uh, moderate uh, the presentations and discussions. Hi everyone, uh, my name is Xing. Um, so I'm glad to introduce the first presenter in the session, Manessa Gopel from Georgia Institute of Technology. Uh, the floor is yours, you have uh, 25 minutes. I will give you a reminder, like three minutes uh, before the end. Uh, great, uh, I hope you can see my screen. Uh, thank you so much for having us on this session. Today, I'm going to be talking about the rise of finance companies and fintech lenders in small business lending. And this paper is co-authored with Philip Schnabel. Um, so our paper is motivated by two main facts about small businesses. The first being that after the 2008 financial crisis, there was a significant drop in lending to small businesses from banks. So if you look at 2016 volumes, about um, the lending was still about 24% below bank lending to small businesses in 2006. And particularly among the four largest banks, there was a significant drop by lending falling by over 40%. But at the same time, small businesses are critical for economic growth, right? So small and medium enterprises, which are about 95% of all businesses in the US, they account for almost half of all employment. They generate two out of the three net new jobs in the economy annually. And overall, economy um, employment in the economy after the financial crisis took a long time to recover, reaching back to 2008 levels only by about 2014. So in this paper, we ask whether this reduction in bank lending led to slow economic recovery after the 2008 financial crisis. So particularly in this paper, we want to address what the role of the financial sector has been in the post-2008 recovery. Did lack of lending to bank dependent firms slow down recovery? And what is the ability of the financial sector to replace bank lending? So consequently, we study what the role of small businesses is in economic recovery, what the reliance of small businesses is on bank financing, and the ability of these small businesses to be able to substitute to alternate sources of funding. Um, so we face two main challenges in trying to address this question. The first is a measurement issue. Uh, since most small businesses in the US are privately held, we don't really have any financial information on these small businesses. So currently the main data set we have on small business lending is, which is the CRA data, focuses exclusively on lending by banks to small businesses. But even then, we don't cover all banks or all firms. But anecdotally, we've also seen that non-bank lenders have been growing in importance uh, since the 2008 crisis. And to be able to really study total small business lending, we need information on financing from all sources to these small businesses. Um, the second issue, as with any empirical paper, is identification. Um, so essentially, we need to be able to disentangle credit supply from credit demand, right? So the decline in small business lending after the financial crisis could have been due to either of these factors. And we need some sort of plausibly quasi-exogenous variation in credit supply 
to be able to identify the effect of it. Um, so in this paper, we're going to deal with these two issues. The first uh, measurement issue we're going to actually deal with by collecting new loan level data on the universe of secured small business lending in the US. This data is going to come from what are known as the Uniform Commercial Code or UCC filings. And I'm going to spend um, a lot of time talking about this data in, quite a, uh, in just a bit. But the advantage of this data set is that it includes all lenders, both banks and non-banks like finance companies and fintechs. And we have a large enough sample that covers the pre-financial crisis period, the crisis as well as the post-recovery period. Um, and the interesting and important aspect of the UCC data is that we have a lot of borrower level characteristics, such as the industry of the borrower, the collateral they pledge, where they originate the loan. Um, to deal with the identification issue, we are going to be making use of geographical variation in a region's bank dependence. Okay, so we're going to use the region's 2006 or pre-crisis bank dependence. And the idea here is that there was a national shock to bank lending and regions were differentially affected based on how reliant they were on banks pre-financial crisis. And we're going to exploit this variation to study what the effect of the decline in bank lending was on non-bank lending, on total lending, as well as real outcomes. And besides this identification strategy, we're also going to be looking at a within-firm estimator to study bank and non-bank lending to the same borrower at the same time. We're also going to be comparing bank-affiliated and independent finance companies that make similar loans to similar borrowers, but differ in their regulation. Uh, so the main takeaway from our paper is that non-banks are an extremely important source of financing to small businesses. And we can actually see that from three figures that I want to show you. So in the first one here, we're uh, plotting the total number of loans from banks and non-banks in our sample. And two things become clear from this figure. The first is that non-banks are an important source of credit to small businesses. They were important even pre-financial crisis doing over half of all lending to small businesses. But more importantly, after 2010, they've grown significantly in volume. So by 2016, nearly 60% of all loans that were made to small businesses were coming from non-banks. Of these non-banks, most of the growth has been among independent finance companies, which I'll just define in a bit, and fintech lenders. So especially fintech lenders were practically non-existent before 2010, but between 2010 and 16, nearly a third of the growth of non-banks has been driven by the fintech lenders. And interestingly, what we see is that this non-bank lending growth is essentially substituted for a decline in bank lending. So um, the first figure shows you that between 2007 and 16, regions that were initially pre-financial crisis, more reliant on banks, those are precisely the regions that saw greater non-bank growth. But what the second figure essentially shows you is that this growth in non-bank lending has been substituting a decline in bank lending, such that overall, there is no difference in total lending uh, growth between 2007 and 16, based on the region's pre-financial crisis bank dependence. And so overall, total lending growth has remained, is uncorrelated with the, uh, the pre-financial crisis bank dependence. And similarly, we see that there's no difference in real outcomes across regions that are more or less bank dependent because of this growth in non-bank lending. Um, so before I actually get into the details of the paper, I just want to provide some background on what I mean by finance companies and fintech lenders. Um, so finance companies, um, unlike banks, they don't fund themselves through deposits. They primarily use long-term debt to finance themselves. Um, and as we all know, most of bank funding is through deposits. And because finance companies don't typically fund themselves through deposits, they're also not subject to a lot of the regulation banks are. Uh, they are however, still subject to some of the lending laws, such as usury limits. Um, and banks, have you know specialized in multiple lines of business 
Unlike that, finance companies, they typically tend to be specialized in a single line of business. So say business lending. And there is conventionally the idea that finance companies and banks differ in their business model. And finance companies, they typically tend to make asset-based loans, meaning that they make their lending decisions based on the asset value or the collateral of the borrower, while banks do what's known as cash flow lending. That is, they make their lending decisions based on current and future cash flow predictions of the firm. So we have two main types of finance companies in our sample. They're going to be the independently run finance companies and what are known as captive finance companies. So captive finance companies are financing arms of parent manufacturing companies, and they typically only lend against collateral of the parent manufacturing company. So you can think of, say, John Deere, um, the manufacturing company has a John Deere financing arm that lends against the parent um, collateral. And because uh, finance companies, they tend to specialize in a single line of business, they're also much, much smaller than banks are. Uh, but if we look at just the business lending market, they actually have similar market shares. And this is going to be one of the big takeaways from our paper. We also have uh, fintech lenders in our sample. And we think of fintech lenders as online lenders that do not accept, do not usually take deposits. So when um, typically loans of fintech lenders are originated with the partnership with a funding bank. So the fintech is going to uh, make the loan, the bank is going to originate it, and then fintech loans purchase, uh, fintech lenders purchase these loans immediately after origination. And typically this funding bank is regulated in a, um, is uh, located in a region that has low regulation and low usury limits so they can provide loans of high interest rates across the country. Um, in our sample specifically, most of the FinTech lenders we have are what are known as merchant cash advances. Um, so these lenders make short-term loans, which are repaid based on daily uh, debit card and credit card receivables. And even though a lot of FinTech lenders, and this is gonna be important, advertise as being unsecured, they actually typically require a blanket lien from the borrowers. And this is something that's going to be covered in our data set. So I think that's a good point to actually talk about what the UCC data covers. Um, so one of the novel contributions of our paper is going to be introducing the uh, Uniform Commercial Code or the UCC filings. The UCC filings are made to determine priority in bankruptcy. So anytime a secured loan is originated, a filing is made at a state level registry and the idea is that if a borrower goes bankrupt, these filings are used to determine who has claims to the borrower's assets and what the priority of the claim is. And each of these filings, they contain information on when the loan was originated, who the borrower is, who the lender is, and a detailed description of the collateral that's pledged. And since, so these filings, as I said, they're made at the state level. And what we do is we collect these filings across all 50 states in the US to create a quasi credit registry for US businesses. And uh, our sample goes from about 2006 to 2016. Um, and the UCC data um, based because of the legality of the filings, they're only made for secured non-real non estate loans. The real estate loans are covered by UCC filings, but they're actually at, the filings are made at local county level offices. And because we have state level filings, we are only going to be able to capture the non-real estate secured lending in the US. Um, the disadvantage, of course, of the data is that the loan contracts are still private information, meaning we only know whether a loan is originated, but we don't have information about the loan amount or pricing terms. And in the paper, we actually spend a lot of time talking about how we think our data is complementary to the existing CRA data. Uh, but since the data is uh, new, I just want to spend a couple of minutes talking about the external validity and how much we're actually able to cover with the UCC data. Um, so as I said, the UCC data it covers all non-real estate secured lending, meaning we are going to be uh, omitting the unsecured credit as well as real estate lending to small businesses. Um, so first about unsecured, uh, 
we are pretty confident that nearly all small business lending is secured through multiple sources we are able to validate that over 96% of small business lending is actually secured probably one of the largest sources of unsecured lending is credit card borrowing but uh, even though many small businesses have credit cards uh, the federal board uh, report actually shows that less than 1.5% of total small business borrowing is through credit cards um and as i said before even though many lenders advertise as unsecured they often require blanket liens which is under the ucc purview so probably the bigger part that we are missing is going to be real estate lending um we think that somewhere around 13 to 22% of small business lending is secured by commercial real estate and um this actually is in line with how many businesses even have any real estate to pledge to originate these loans so only about 19% of small businesses own real estate um so putting these together we think that the ucc data covers about 73% of all small business lending which is much larger than what you would get from conventional data sources like the cra which ignores all of the non bank lending Okay, so what we essentially see in our paper is that between two thousand six and sixteen, bank lending uh, remained almost flat, growing by only about five percent, while non-banks grew by over forty percent in this period. And most of the non-bank lending growth was concentrated among the independent finance companies and the fintech lenders, um, which grew significantly after two thousand. Okay um so coming to our empirical analysis as i said before our primary concern is being able to disentangle credit supply from credit demand so the decline in bank lending after 2008 could have been driven either by bank supply or demand for bank loans and so what we're going to try to do is address this issue by looking at cross sectional variation in bank dependence of the region pre financial crisis so the idea here is that there's a decline in bank lending or a national decline in bank lending due to regulation risk management losses to banks during the financial crisis and so on but different areas are affected differentially because of how reliant they were on banks historically and of course the identification assumption here is that is going to be that this geographic difference in bank dependence is uncorrelated with demand for non bank loans after 2000 um so to show you this i first want to show you um, the change in bank lending across different regions here essentially we're just plotting the percentage change in bank lending between 2007 and 10 in both the ucc data and the cra data and what we see is that the uh, change in bank lending in a region is almost uncorrelated to the region's pre-financial crisis bank dependence however if you look at bank lending as a share of total lending in the region we see that there is um, a significant negative correlation so regions that were more reliant on banks they see a much larger decline in bank lending as a share of total lending in the region um just to give you an idea of what the pre financial crisis bank shares look like uh, this is just um, county level variation in the financial in the pre financial crisis bank share so we do see significant variation in um, the dependence but we do see that there's some level of state level clustering so we are going to be including state fixed effects in um, most of our analysis So our main specification is the following. So we're going to regress change in county lending between 2007 and 2016 on the region's pre-financial crisis bank shares by including state fixed effects as well as county level controls. So what do we see? We see that between 2007 and 16, regions that were initially more reliant on banks they see a greater growth in non bank market share driven by a growth in non bank lending but overall this non bank lending growth has substituted for a decline in bank lending such that total lending remains almost flat okay so non bank lending has replaced bank lending such that there is no impact on total lending in a region 
due to their uh, pre-financial crisis bank dependence. We see similar things in the regression table itself. Uh, so moving from the 10th to the 90th percentile of bank share increases non-bank market share by about 7.2 percentage points and non-bank lending by about 18 percent. Uh, in the paper, we also actually, since we have borrower level information, we actually control for the borrower industry as well as collateral and our results are consistent. We then actually split our sample into the crisis and the recovery period. So what we see is between 2007 and 10, total lending falls more in regions that were more reliant on banks uh, while non-bank lending remained almost flat. But between 2010 and 16, total lending grows driven primarily by this growth in non-bank lending. Um, so uh, our previous identification strategy, of course, uh, relied on the fact that this demand for non-bank loans is uncorrelated with the 2006 uh, bank dependence of the region, but it could be that demand is varying. So what we want to try to do now is use a within form estimator to exploit lending by banks and non-banks to the same borrower. So to control for borrower level credit demand. Um, of course, this also again works under the assumption that there's no change in preference for the same borrower between bank and non-bank loans over time. Um, so here, what we're going to do is we're going to take um, all borrowers that had loans from both banks and non-banks in the pre-financial crisis period, so in 2006 and 7, and we're going to look at the likelihood of them getting a repeat loan after 2008 by including firm fixed effects, and our, our coefficient of interest is going to be the beta on the dummy of whether the lender is a bank, is a non-bank. Um, so what we see, we see that borrowers that had loans from both banks and non-banks in the pre-financial crisis period are a lot more likely to get a repeat loan after 2008 from non-banks. Similarly, if we look at borrowers that only had either a bank or a non-bank loan, it's again the borrowers that were borrowing from non-banks in the pre-financial crisis who are more likely to get a loan after 2008. Um, Okay, so the within firm uh, estimator controls for borrower level demand, but it could be that banks and non-banks, they serve the same borrower for different loan types. Okay, um, so there may be differences in loan specific demand. So what our solution for this is to compare uh, two types of lenders that actually make similar loans to similar borrowers. So specifically bank affiliated finance companies and non-bank affiliated finance companies. Um, the difference here is the regulation. So bank affiliated finance companies, they're regulated along with the parent bank holding company, while independent or non-bank affiliated finance companies are not, even though they make uh, very similar loans. Uh, so that, if we, you have uh, three minutes, sorry. Okay, thank you. Yeah. So um, if we expect that this uh, difference, if the growth in non-banks is coming for demand for a specific type of loans, we'd expect the bank affiliated finance companies to behave very similarly to independent finance companies. But what we actually see is that bank affiliated finance companies behave a lot more like the banks do, right? So they are losing market share over time, while the non-banks and the independent finance companies are actually gaining market share. Um, so finally, we have some results on the real effects. Uh, as I showed before, total lending is actually um, unchanged over a time. So it's uncorrelated with the pre-financial crisis bank shares. This actually even shows up in real outcomes. So there's no impact of the region's bank dependence on long-term real outcomes, such as growth in establishments, employment, or change in wages. And in the paper, we also actually have this at the county industry level. Uh, we have a lot more robustness checks in the paper, which I will of course, skip in the interest of time. Um, but the main takeaway from our paper is that finance companies uh, and fintech lenders are an important source of financing to small businesses. We show this by introducing a new data set that covers the universe of secured small business lending in the US. And we see that these finance companies and fintech lenders have substituted for the missing or decline in bank lending 
and they've been able to substitute such that there's been no long-term impact on both total lending and real effects in a region. Uh, probably the main thing that we want you to take away from this paper is that non-banks are an extremely important source of financing to these small businesses. And by 2016, nearly 60% of small business loans are coming from non-banks. And it's important to consider these lenders when you're making policies with regard to small business. Thank you. Great, thanks. So our discussant is Adrian Outer from IMF. Um, Adrian? Hi, everyone. Yes. Um, let me share my slides. Yeah, I have 10 minutes. Can you see well? Yes, perfect. OK, perfect. Thank you. So first of all, uh, I'd like to thank organizers for inviting me uh, to discuss this paper. Um, second, it is a privilege to, to discuss a well-crafted paper uh, by Mansa and uh, Philip. So that's, that's a really nice paper. And uh, thirdly, the usual disclaimer applies. So the views expressed in this presentation are my own and do not necessarily uh, represent the views of the IMF. So um, the talk will be structured along these four uh, pillars. So I, I first briefly uh, touch upon the contributions of the paper, the main contributions. Then I'll talk about the data validation because that's an important aspect of the paper being an empirical paper. Um, thirdly, I, I'll give my main comments and uh, finally, I'll talk about some potential extensions and uh, robustness checks. So um, as uh, Mansa has explained to us, the, the paper, um, the, the main um, objective or the main finding of the paper is to document the rise of uh, non-bank lending to small, medium uh, businesses in the aftermath of the GFC. Uh, and you can see here in the two uh, charts, um, the, the left one shows you clearly uh, the, the, the rise in non-bank lending, uh, which is at a much steeper curve than the bank lending, uh, the, the line below. And more importantly, you see that this um, rise in um, uh, non-bank lending to small businesses has been primarily affected by the independent finance companies and the fintech companies. So these two results are, I, I think, the main motivation of the paper, and they, they well they, they are well documented in the in in, in this paper. Now the, the second uh, strand of results refer to empirical analysis and um, the uh, uh, what the authors show is that the non-bank uh, lending grew much uh, more in, uh, in counties dominated by banks prior to the global financial crisis. And they attribute these to um, a so-called substitution effect. So the non-banks took over some of the lending from the banks. And um, uh, the hypothesis here is twofold. One it could be regulation. Um, so uh, Dodd Frank Act had much uh, higher capital requirements for banks, and thus the banks were not uh, taking uh, this uh, risk um, because small um, business uh, lending is quite risky, um, and thus the non banks uh, stepped in. And the the other important uh, result, which I think it it uh, it, it is quite uh, relevant in the paper is that there is no long-term impact uh, on total lending uh, and uh, um, uh, employment. So here are the real effects that uh, Mansa was talking about um, from this uh, credit supply shock. Um, and here you see on the right-hand side the chart that this, uh, this line is flat. Now, I will, I will spend a bit more time um, in, the, in the next slides on how these things might, might, might be different if you look with other lenses. So um, why the, the, um, the rise in uh, non, 
uh, bank lending is new. And there is quite an extensive literature now. Um, it started in like 2016-17 with Bushak uh, et al. Uh, paper uh, in JFE. And they uh, document the, the rise of the, of the non-bank lending, particularly in the, uh, in the mortgage market. And here I, I plotted two uh, charts from uh, one of my papers with, uh, with uh, one of the M one MIT uh, PhD student, uh, Zaki Dernai. And uh, we, what we found in that paper is that, um, first of all, we look at the mortgage market, we look at about 90 million uh, real estate transactions between 1998 and 2018. Um, and we, we document this evolution of, uh, of, uh, of the non-bank lending and how that substitutes bank lending. And we, we show that this is correlated with interest rates as well. So when the interest rates and the risk um, increases, um, then banks have a, 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 have a higher share. And when things are in good times, uh, non-bank lending uh, uh, in increases. So um, at the same time, we, we show that lending quality might differ um, and uh, thus riskier loans are, are typically originated by non-banks. Um, and we, we claim that this is somehow some uh, uh, regulatory arbitrage. Now, um, the last point I wanted to make here is that the rise of, uh, in, in shadow banking uh, is not only associated with riskier mortgages, but also with higher speculation in the mortgage uh, market. And they jointly amplify the boom bust cycle. So that's, it's, it's, a, it's kind of concerning from a systemic risk point of view and financial stability. So go back to the, uh, to the paper. Um, uh, that Mans and Philip wrote, the main contribution and the main uh, part is about these UCC uh, filings, which is completely novel to the literature. It covers all um, secured uh, US business loans, including leases, but excluding real estate, which is a, a relatively important share. Um, it includes all uh, 50 states plus DC, um, and it does not include the loan amount, which can uh, raise uh, uh, several challenges, uh, as uh, Mansa has uh, um, mentioned. But the authors do a, a good job in uh, kind of trying to impute these values based on the collateral uh, used. And I think there is more uh, to exploit in, in that area. And you will see some of the results with uh, county collateral uh, interactions have show, show different nuances of the picture I showed at the beginning. So my main point here is that the, given that this is an empirical paper, the authors could build additional credibility by further validating the new data. And I give here three uh, potential avenues. So first compare the growth rates of, uh, of the number of loans of small firms with lending growth rates at the aggregate level over the analyzed period. So um, use perhaps state level uh, aggregated uh, loan growth or even at the US level uh, to show some comparisons how this data set compares with the aggregated number. Uh, not at the, basically not at the loan amount, but number of loans. Um, the, the second way is to, uh, um, compare it with the asset-backed securities market. So uh, as Mansa has pointed out, the funding of, uh, of uh, uh, non-bank uh, financial institutions is primarily through uh, asset-backed securities. So they securitize these loans and then resell them. Uh, and thus it would be interesting to show, uh, to compare uh, the growth rates in, this, in the uh, UCC uh, data with, with this market. And then finally, uh, when comparing it with um, the CRA data, it would be nice to show some stats, some stats on the common uh, uh, aspects of both databases. So um, for instance, we know that bank lenders are in both data, uh, data sets. 
We know that uh, secured loans uh, are in, in, in both. We exclude the, the real estate, we can exclude the real estate and then potentially show some trends in, in both to um, better validate the data. Now, um, here are my main uh, comments on uh, the empirics and um, um, the empirical so analysis. You have, uh, sorry, you have two minutes. So okay, you, okay, I'll go summary. quickly. Okay, okay. Yeah, thanks. empirical yeah. analysis at the uh, county level could be a feature and it could exploit this um, cross-sectional variation between non-tradable and tradable industries, uh, also by collateral type. Then uh, robustness checks, it could be, could be done clustering at the uh, state level or um, and collateral level when uh, those fixed effects are used. Um, and uh, finally, the real, real sector analysis is interesting, but could be better exploited and potentially expanded. Uh, otherwise, I would drop it. Now, on the identification strategy, uh, the main point here, if uh, similar to the rest of the shadow banking literature, um, it is all about uh, convenience and timeliness. So shadow banks uh, are, are faster than banks and are less stringent on the requirements. Uh, so there could be some substantial technological um, changes that took place in this period, and thus it could have altered the, the preferences of uh, borrowers. And then uh, empirically, the dependent when the dependent variable uh, is a dummy variable, one might have to use a probit or logic instead of the OLS. Now, some potential extensions, I, I give you here three uh, main areas. Um, exploit the heterogeneity of firm riskiness if, if possible. Show what are the differences between less profitable or more leveraged firms and use interactions to tease out uh, the, the type of firms this why uh, some firms disproportionately increase borrowing from non-banks. Second, identify which banks have uh, substantially uh, reduced lending to small businesses. Um, consolidated supervision of banking institutions, which uh, banks are exempt from, from, the, from the BHC Act. That would be interesting to to show whether there is some heterogeneity uh, on that aspect. And finally, if there are uh, various states treating uh, mm -hmm. more preferentially the fintech firms, uh, then I sh you should kind of show some robustness excluding some of the states. So uh, let me conclude. Um, I highly recommend reading this paper. Uh, the authors have done a tremendous uh, amount of work. The, the, the data is really novel. Questions and uh, contributions are important to the literature. Um, and then finally, uh, a theoretical model might not be necessary, uh, but perhaps provide more intuition on hypotheses and motives behind the bank non bank substitution. I'll stop here. Thank you. Okay, thanks. Uh, so there are two questions uh, from the Q&A box. I thought I could uh, just briefly talk about it, ask it, and then Manessa can try to respond to Adrian and these two questions. Uh, so one question is about whether you have thought about looking into the effect of Basel III regulation in, in, um, in the US, whether this uh, could uh, potentially um, lead to a decline of bank credit. And the second question is, what is the lesson for emerging countries and the developing countries when you don't have uh, this type of data, whether you have, uh, is there any opportunities for non-banks to serve uh, financial, of serve firms who, which face a stronger uh, lending constraints? So these two types of questions. Okay. Uh, great. So first of all, Adrian, thank you so much for your uh, great discussion. I think you obviously bring up a lot of points for us to consider. Maybe just a couple of quick responses to some of the things. Um, so about why we think uh, showing non-bank lending in this particular um, segment is interesting is, I think, as you've said before, people have shown it, say, in the mortgage literature. Uh, people have also spoken about it in lending to larger businesses. Uh, but we think this market is slightly different because, say, unlike in the mortgage market where these loans are originated and taken off balance sheet. Um, in small business lending, all these non all these loans um, by both banks and non-banks are held on to the on their balance sheet. Um, so it's not this 
same type of funding structure. It's not a market that is very, um, you know, um, transparent. And typically, one always thought, at least conventionally in the literature, that small business lending was a bank business because you need to have soft information, you need to have relationship. But uh, we kind of show that that has been changing. Um, yeah, so definitely take your point about comparing our um, data set a lot more to what is um, otherwise available. And I think of doing a, a lot more of that in a revision that we're currently working on. Um, yeah, I think, um, yeah, we ha you had some great ideas for new tests that we can do. Um, I think I want to partly relate that to one of the questions in the Q&A, which asked about stricter regulation leading to decline in bank credit. Uh, actually, we have a few new analyses, um, which is looking at uh, regions where there were more stress-tested banks, regions where banks had to increase capital to a greater extent. Um, as expected, those are the banks and those are the regions where we see a greater decline in bank lending and uh, more non-bank growth. But consistently across all of the measures that we use, uh, we actually see that non-bank lending is almost entirely substituting for bank lending. Um, so we do see uh, small banks are partially substituting for the top four lending decline, but it's not sufficient to fully make up. Uh, and non-bank lending is extremely important for um, covering the entire gap. Um, I think there was another question uh, in the Q&A about whether we could potentially use the UCC data in developing countries. Um, so unfortunately, this is... Um, US legal requirement for the filing. So we might not be able to use it in other settings, but um, we may be able to take away some of the lessons from here for SMEs. Um, I guess there was this question about, um, you know, what the opportunity is for FinTech growth in underdeveloped countries. Um, I think there are a lot of countries where fintechs have been growing at a much higher pace than the US. I think at this point, it's hard to say what the benefits and the risks are because most of what we have been showing is in a relatively good period of the economy between 2010 and 16. I think it'll be a lot more interesting to study how fintechs behaved during the COVID pandemic, for example, or when um, in a recession. Um, and I think that's probably not exactly the purview of uh, the current paper, but It'll be super interesting to study. Yeah, thanks, Melissa. So let's move on to the second paper. Um, the second paper will be presented by Vatsa from University of St. Gallen. The floor is yours. You have uh, 25 minutes. Thank you very much. Let me try and share my slides. Okay, hopefully you can all see them now. Um, okay, so good European afternoon, everybody, and thank you very much to the organizers for having me here today. Um, this paper is joint work with Alan Kwan, Chen Lin, and Ming Chutai, all from the University of Hong Kong. And as the name suggests, this is basically about banks' digital capabilities and kind of the role that they played during the first wave of the COVID-19 pandemic. Now, kind of, sorry, slides. Um, so kind of why we why we thought this would be an interesting setting to look at is basically that COVID-19 was um, was both unexpected and unprecedented shock to digital demand or to digital banking demand. So suddenly you have all these mobility restrictions in place, uh, going to bank branch may be both physically difficult and possibly uh, risky in the sense that you might might risk contracting a possibly deadly virus. So suddenly these digital alternatives become much more important. Now, it's hard to get good kind of aggregated data on, on any, any um, measures of digital banking. Basically, a lot of banks put out some numbers of digital, digital banking volumes during the kind of spring last year. And basically, all of, across all of those, you see kind of very large increases in digital banking volumes kind of across pretty much any measures, kind of high double digit, sometimes even close to triple digit growth. Um, so that, that was kind of, and that's, there's some anecdotal headline evidence here to that, that effect as well. And the other interesting 
thing about this was that there's also kind of anecdotal evidence that it didn't always go super smoothly for all the banks involved. So for example, the top left corner of Wall Street Journal article here is talking about uh, how some SME customers ended up uh, essentially switching banks because they couldn't get their, the services that they needed from their existing lenders because they were struggling. So that's that's kind of where the where the where we're coming from with this setting. And then how large was this shock? Again, it's we don't have any good aggregate data on digital banking volume. So this is again very anecdotal, but this is basically the Google online search volumes for online banking. And here's so the the orange line here, that's basically the, the number of new COVID cases in US um, during the spring last year. Uh, and the blue line here is Google search volumes for online banking. And what you see there is basically it's kind of it's normally kind of flat around 30 here and it's when you when you see here the COVID-19 cases go up you see kind of a corresponding huge peak in the search volumes for online banking um, and this is kind of essentially double to normal levels um, and this is also if you extended this chart further back it is, is really unique peak in the sense that this this chart is has been kind of flat at around 30 for any number of years before this point in time so this is really kind of unusual peak in on, online searches for online banking. Um, so basically, that's, that was kind of the, the background idea. So what we wanted to do in this paper is essentially just to ask whether banks that have a, had kind of better digital capabilities going into the crisis uh, were also then better able to adjust to this uh, shift from um, uh, sort of offline to online or digital banking, so whether they were basically better able to uh, serve their customers digitally. Um, now, obviously, to do that, you need sort of two things. So first of all, you need some kind of uh, meaningful way to measure IT at the bank level. Um, so what we do do there is essentially we construct this bank level IT index based on the existence of certain technologies. I'll talk more about the, the measures later on. Um, and then we kind of uh, patch together data from various sources to look at different bank outcomes. So we look at things like uh, non-physical branch visits. We look at thing, uh, website traffic. We look at uh, reaction times on the bank's website. So how fast they react to COVID-19 on the website. We look at the, the PPP loan program. So as probably everybody knows here, that's the, the kind of main US um, SME lending support uh, program um, during the pandemic. Um, we look at bank deposit growth, and then we look at the look at SME's likelihood to switch lenders uh, during the, the first wave of the pandemic. So that's that's kind of kind of what we do. And then to give you a quick quick summary of the results, so what we find is basically that during the first wave of the pandemic, uh, better bank IT is associated with first of all a larger reduction in physical branch visits and then kind of correspondingly larger increase in website traffic. So these two kind of basically mean that the, you have kind of, when you have better IT at the bank, uh, you have a larger shift from um, offline to online banking in terms of volumes. Um, also, we find that these IT me measures that we, we um, construct, they're also correlated with the kind of earlier mentions of COVID-19 on the bank website. So it looks like these banks also, their websites seem to be kind of more nimble in reacting um, to, the, to the pandemic. Um, also, better IT is associated with larger PPP loan volumes originated by these uh, banks. Um, and it's, it's also associated with higher deposit growth during that period. Um, and also in the, with the, within the PPP volumes, the nice thing is we can also, we have kind of county level data. So we know the location. So we can basically, we have, have a bit more cross-sectional variation there. Um, and we find basically that the, the effect of IT as we measure it on PPP loan volumes is larger for areas that first of all have more severe COVID-19 outbreaks. Um, and secondly, in areas that have higher internet use or broadband penetration. So kind of more, uh, in some sense, more tech savvy areas. And also in areas where there's uh, more SME loan competition. Um, then we look, or we also find that um, these small, uh, small businesses in areas that are harder hit by COVID-19 are more likely to change lending relationship to a bank with better IT than their existing lender had, um, and kind of vice versa in the other direction. Um, and then kind of in some sense, anecdotally, we also we also see that banks that were harder hit by COVID-19 due to their geographic footprint, 
they actually increase their IT index, which is our kind of measure of, of IT technology, more in, in during 2020. So basically they invest in these technologies that make up our IT index. So that's in some sense kind of sanity check that our measure seems to make some sense at that, according to the banks themselves as well. Um, now then just very quickly, kind of where do we think we uh, fit into the literature? So there's obviously some related work on, on banks and technology. And um, first of all, there's this branch of research, large or rather large branch of research on the importance of, or importance of bank branches. Um, I think, I guess, very, very roughly the, the general conclusion tends to be that while the, the importance or the number of branches at least has been in the decline for a very long period, it still seems that these physical branches do matter and sort of exogenous branch closings have kind of pretty important uh, uh, effects. Um, Secondly, there's a couple of papers looking at kind of specific settings of how technology can perhaps help reduce uh, reliance on physical branches, which of course part of part of what we're trying to do here. Um, then there's some papers looking at bank, just generally bank performance uh, versus IT investment, often using kind of reasonably um, rough measures of, of IT investment. Um, here, maybe the closest paper to ours is the last one, the Pierre and Timur, they look at the bank um, essentially PC penetrations, how many, it was just number of computers the bank, and then the loan losses the banks incurred during the financial crisis. So a little bit similar idea to ours, um, but quite different outcomes, obviously. Um, and then of course, there's a large literature on kind of FinTech and uh, well, non-bank lenders, which of course the previous paper was, was uh, related to as well. Um, and basically there's evidence that FinTech can obviously represent kind of competitive advantage uh, in a number of domains, including things like credit analysis, better customer experience, uh, tapping on the un underserved clientele and so on. So that's like, I think kind of broadly where we think we, um, we fit in with this. Now, what we actually do, so as I said, we kind of uh, scrape together a bunch of data from, from a relatively large number of sources. So for our IT data comes from Aberdeen. They have something called Computer Intelligence Technology Database. I'll talk a little bit more about that on the next slide. Um, we measure physical branch visits using data from a company called SafeGraph. So what they do is they essentially track mobile phones. They produce anonymized mobile phone location statistics covering about 10% of the US mobile devices. And basically within the universe they cover, we can basically, we can basically see how many people visit each bank branch at uh, each point in time. And that's what we use to, to look at the physical branch visits. Um, then we get website visit data from, uh, from a company called Census. What they do is they essentially monitor the, the Alex rank top 1 million websites. Um, we don't get the actual kind of um, volumes of visitors, but we get relative rankings over time. So we can see basically see how the relative volumes change over time, even if you don't see the un actual underlying volume there. Um, then we use data with some, from some, something called built with. So this, they, they index kind of website technologies over time. What that mean, means that we can, first of all, look at the kind of technological composition of the website, but we can also go back in time and we can see kind of when they inter introduced things there. And in, in our case, basically when they started talking about COVID-19 on their website. Um, then obviously the PPP loan level data is from the SBA, quite standard. Um, also bank financial information from FDIC call reports, very standard. Uh, we used COVID-19 case data from Johns Hopkins. Um, we have mobility restrictions data from a company called Keystone Strategy. So they had kind of this um, basically county level database of all these restrictions uh, for most of last year. So that's what we use to measure those. Um, and then, so on the IT measure itself. So as I said, this comes, the data comes from Aberdeen. So they cover so three plus million establishments in the US. Uh, this amounts to about 85% of all establishments with employment size of about 10. Um, and what they do is essentially they have a, they do a couple of things, but what we, they, but most importantly for us, they track all these specific technologies at the establishment level. Um, so they have something like around say, between 60 and 70 different technologies they track. And so what we do is our, our kind of what we call IT index. So this is our main measure of bank IT here. What we do basically is we go through that list and we, 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 um, looked at things, technologies that to us uh, kind of ex ante sound like they would likely be useful for things like virtual, auto automated, remote work, these kinds of things. And so what, what that in 
ends up including is things like VPN, remote access software, document management, other collaborative software, uh, CRM software, video conferencing tools, internet phone, uh, database software, server virtualization, these kind of things. And what we do is basically we aggregate this uh, across the bank offices using a not just number of employees, which is part of the data set as a kind of a weighting variable there. Um, and we kind of aggregate that into a bank level IT index. So that's what this comes from. So it's basically an index that ranges from, from one to 14. Now, obviously you might hear be concerned that maybe we're just cherry picking, uh, you know, random technologies that, that uh, you know, exposed work for us. Um, so to make sure that's not the case, what we do is we also look at the, look at a bunch of different kind of alternative proxies for IT as a, as a robustness check. Uh, those include uh, what we call IT index other. That's basically all these other these that these other technologies included in the data that we did not put into the main. So excluding these fourteen, but all the rest of it, otherwise calculating similar index. Um, we also look at IT, a number of IT staff. Uh, scaled by total employees, and we look at the bank's IT budget scaled by employees. And basically, using all of those three, we can essentially replicate all our results. So it's it's not very sensitive to the kind of definition of IT. Um, there is, um, we, I should say though, that our IT index it's is if you horse race these different measures, our IT index generally does beat the IT index other, which measures the other technologies. So you might say that that's that suggests that maybe. Maybe the, our selection of technologies does make some sense in the context we look at. Now, here's kind of just, again, um, anecdotal uh, headline from Financial Times talking about the uh, pensioners warming up to video chat. But here, this is a little bit just to kind of explain how we came up with this stuff. So well, I was on a at a different conference in a panel where there was a CTO of a, a sort of medium-sized US bank, and she was talking about how what they did uh, um, at the onset of the pandemic, they basically kind of started uh, switching branch staff or, or educating branch staff to essentially act as call centers or video call centers or serving customers virtually. So we we're kind of thinking about these kinds of things and figure, trying to figure out what what might be the technologies helping that sort of sort of transitions. Um, here's maybe this may be the easiest to visualize kind of results. So this is just a physical branch visits at the kind of uh, spring last year. So we, what we did is we split the banks in our data into three buckets based on their IT index value. The, the kind of blue line here is the lowest IT banks and the red line here is the highest IT banks. And basically what you see here is when, as these kind of, as the COVID cases start going up somewhere here in March, basically you see, you see a significantly large or clearly larger reduction in physical branch visits in the kind of high IT bank bucket relative to the low IT bank. And we didn't put, plot the mid, mid IT bank uh, line here, but it would be basically in the middle of these two. Um, uh, Vesa, Vesa, there's yeah. a clarification question from Tony. Oh, okay. Yeah, he wants to ask you whether your IT cap, cap capability measure is more granular, but similar to another measure uh, by okay. Perry yeah. and uh, Timmy. Timmy? Yeah. Um, well, I mean, you could say so. It's what what they, they if I remember correctly, hopefully, what they what they do is basically they just take the number of uh, PCs at the bank has divided by number of employees. Essentially, it's just the PC penetration. So, you could argue it, it's similar similar in kind of um, in some sense uh, in similar way, <laughs> but it's uh, it's somewhat different. Sorry about the background noise. Uh, but um, so yeah, it's you. You could say that what we're doing is a bit more granular, slightly different, but not completely different in terms of uh, the idea. Um, okay, so here's essentially back to the branch visits. This is kind of the same thing, but in a regression format. So here, this is a branch level regression. So the unit of observation is a bank branch week, and what the left hand side is the is the number of branch visits or the log of it. And what we do is we regress that on um, essentially the um, the restrictions. So this is basically a dummy indicating whether there's mobility restrictions in place at the location of this bank branch at that point in time. Um, and, and we interact that with the IT index. So that's kind of the main variable of interest here. It's the first line here. Um, and we, we include uh, branch fixed effects, uh, weak fixed effects. Um, and we and so that's, that's kind of the, the baseline regression setting here. 
Uh, we also include county week fixed effects and some of the, the last specifications here. But essentially the conclusion is the same. So what, have, what you see here is as these mobility restrictions kick in at the branch location, what you see is basically larger reduction in branch visits in the place in, in the banks that have a essentially better IT infrastructure as measured by this IT index we have. Um, the same thing is we have, so this is the restrictions here is a dummy, basically restrictions or no restrictions. The, the, the model columns four to six is the same thing, but instead just summing up the number of different types of, of mobility restrictions. So Keystone had like eight different categories of, uh, of restrictions. So this is kind of just a continuous measure of restrictions, but basically the same conclusion. Then here, kind of to, to, compare, to compare that with, there's then the same thing, but for website traffic. So this is done at the bank level. So obviously banks only have one website generally. So it's this, and this is kind of a coded relative volume ranking variable, which, uh, which uh, works in the, same, in the way that higher value means more website traffic. Um, and here, but basically it's similar regression. And what you see here is that it's the exact opposite of the previous one. So when, when you have these rest mobility restrictions kicking in, basically there's a larger increase in the website traffic for the banks that have better IT as captured by our IT, our IT index. So that's, um, that's basically it. So it's basically this, this with the previous results means that there's kind of, or at least it's consistent with the idea that there's a larger shift from physical branches to bank websites. Now here, then, as I said, we also look at the reaction times. So what this means is basically here's just a couple of random bank websites. But at some point, obviously, last year, uh, all these bank websites started to have these, these uh, kind of COVID banners or COVID sections on their website. So basically what we did, we just went back in the rack and looked at when this, they first time started mentioning COVID-19 on their website. Um, and we also looked at kind of the complexity of just the, co the composition of the website. And basically, this is in some sense a little bit validation of the IT measure as well, if you will. So first of all, here what you see is essentially our IT index, even though it measures something uh, in principle different, it's also strongly correlated with the complexity of the website construction. Um, and then secondly, the response time. So banks that have a higher IT index, they actually did react significantly earlier, start, so started talking about uh, COVID on their website. So can I ask um, you something? Yeah. So about response time, um, maybe it's difficult to get the data, but I wonder if you have any measure of the service from the call centers of banks that like response time for call centers how, may, how much oh like a, like a, like a waiting waiting times and this right right yeah. Yeah. yeah no I, I, unfortunately we, we, yeah. no that would be I, so that would be super interesting data point and i'm not aware of any any way to get that data um if somebody here is i would love to hear about it but um so yeah i, I agree that would be super interesting and unfortunately there we we haven't at least seen anything any way to measure that Right, because that's the response time I have in mind when we talk about the measurement for the for service. No, no, sure. okay, oh, yeah, that, 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 that's completely fair, yeah. No, so what, what we mean here, response is time is, is, is quite different. So this is just basically how fast, when, when things, things went south with COVID in sense, some sense, how fast, you know, the, the websites uh, that you can see basically reacted. So uh, it's, it's not, it's not, it's yeah, not sure. exactly the same thing as how long you wait, wait to get, a, get served on the phone. Yeah, thanks. Yeah. Um, okay, then, yeah, then the, then we look at the, the Paycheck Protection Program. So as, as I'm sure everybody here is well aware, so this was the SME support program designed to help firms and incentivize them to retain workforce. And, and of course, this was done via government-backed loans that were distributed through the commercial banking system. Um, and the idea is obviously, obviously the loan is forgiven if the funds are used for these eligible purposes, which is essentially to pay things like things like salaries and, and uh, rent and mortgages and so on, basically to keep the businesses alive. Um, and so here what we do is we construct kind of a bank county level data set. So the unit, so this is cross-sectional regression, but this is at the county level. So the unit of observation is a bank county. Uh, and we regress essentially the PPP loan volume on the bank's IT index, and then essentially kind of bunch of standard bank controls, anything you can see see kind of on the FDIC call report data. Um, we also include some bank county controls so we can see the bank's lending volume prior to the pandemic or SME lending volume uh, from the SBA data prior to the pandemic. So we control for that in the same county. 
And also we control for the bank's deposit volumes in the same county prior to the pandemic. Um, we, can also, we can also put in county fixed effects here and we can also put, and we also include uh, in the last specification here, the bank's headquarters stage fixed effect. Uh, but basically it doesn't really matter what you throw in as controls. There's a reasonably kind of strong uh, positive relationship between the, uh, the PPP volumes and the IT index value of the bank. Um, here then we, we add some cross-sectional uh, interactions here. So first of all, we look at just how, how many COVID cases there are in the, lo in the location. So, or the, around basically a kind of weighted with the bank's uh, geographic footprint. Um, so kind of how, how severely the bank is affected by COVID-19. Uh, and basically what you see there is, you know, when the bank is more um, affected by COVID-19, it seems that this IT matters more basically as you might expect. Um, also, the internet use, the same thing. So if, if, you, if the geographic footprint is generally kind of has better IT infrastructure generally, uh, then the, oh, it's also the bank's IT seems to matter more. Um, then we look at kind of level of competition with a couple of, couple of rough proxies. So we calculate uh, the HHI index of the SME lending of the, within the same county before the pandemic to get a measure of, measure of competition there. Um, and essentially what you see is when there's when there's more competition, less concentration, then the IT matters more. Um, and similarly, when, when, the, when the bank's competitors in the location have better IT, then also IT index matters more. Uh, so it seems like- Three more minutes. That's yeah. Not. Three more minutes. Okay, thank you. Um, then lastly, we look, at, we look at the likelihood of customers switching banks. So here, this is, um, this is a firm level analysis. We basically take all the firms that we have we, where we have kind of prior lending data before the pandemic and who are, that also exist in the PPP data. And we look at basically whether they obtain their PPP loan from the same lender as they banked with before the pandemic. And here, and then we put in basically just a dummy indicating whether they switched to a better IT bank or, or to, a lo to a lower IT bank and then conditional on the number of COVID cases in the area. And basically in areas or firms that were more exposed to COVID-19 were more likely to switch to a bank with better IT uh, than their prior lender had. Um, and, and then obviously banks that had a better IT lender before were less likely to switch um, and more so when they were more affected by COVID-19. Um, and then finally, as I mentioned, uh, there's also the IT index also correlated with basically higher deposit growth uh, during the first half of 2020. So the first wave of the pandemic. Um, and that's, that's basically it. And also, again, banks more exposed to COVID were more likely to upgrade their IT as, as measured by these things. Now, the last thing I'll say, say very briefly is, so there's, there's an obvious kind of, if we, if we claim that the IT helps banks to, to deal with this, these things, there's kind of some obvious concerns about engine ID. So maybe, maybe some, you know, obviously the investment in IT is the conscious decision by the bank. Um, so maybe some of them kind of anticipate something like this and, and prepare it better. Um, now, of course, what is mitigating this is that this COVID-19 shock was by definition, not probably not anticipated by many banks. Um, so that, that helps. We can also control for this pre-pandemic lending. Um, and it doesn't, it doesn't kind of uh, explain these lenders which results in bank IT upgrades. Um, and of course, you might be concerned that maybe there's clientele effects. So certain customers are just more IT, more IT geared towards IT. Um, so we look, try to look at that, but basically there's no correlation between bank IT and its SME customer IT. So it doesn't look like there's much sorting going on in that sense. Um, and that's basically it. So I'm gonna kind of stop here so I don't, don't uh, go over time. But so, as I said, we, we do find basically positive relations between banks, IT capabilities and their ability to serve customers during the COVID-19 pandemic which and kind of more broadly that suggests that there is this kind of negative relationship between technology and reliance on physical branches. Um, and of course, what is interesting here, we're too early to conclude yet is, so there, there was this long running trend toward more digital banking services. There, now this was kind of a sudden shock to that. And obviously it's gonna be interesting to see how this plays out. So what happens post pandemic and how permanent this shift will be. But just the fact that there is this cross-sectional relationship between IT and banking activity suggests that at least there are significant differences between different banks. And so not, not all banks are equally prepared for these kinds of things. Thank you very much. I'm looking forward to the discussion. Okay, thanks. Uh, the discussant is Xiang Li from uh, Hala Institute for Economic Research.
You have 10 minutes, Xiang. Thank you very much for giving me this great paper to discuss. It's really a pleasure and try to provide some comments. So um, the overview is this paper studies question is what the role of bank IT during the COVID-19 crisis. So the authors has done a lot of work in collecting the data and, and construct various measurements in the following dimensions. So they have new measurements for bank IT and they have uh, the outcome variables for bank performance in three dimensions. In, in terms of bank uh, branch visits and website visits, and second on the PPP loans and bank switching behavior uh, from low IT to high IT banks. And third, they also have the deposit performance as the growth. And what they do is they see this COVID-19 crisis as a shock for the demand of uh, digital financial service. So they use this mobility restrictions and COVID-19 outbreaks as a measurement of the demand shock strength. So the higher this restriction and outbreak, the more demand for the IT service. So the authors, uh, the, they have a, a basic framework is to regress this bank performance variables on the bank IT measurement. And they use the bank IT uh, to interact with the demand shock strength to provide some causal uh, results. And to uh, maybe investor doesn't have the time to talk about that, but they use this IV instrument variable for think IT to address this indoor issue that use this internet access and cyber attack for the bank IT. And their main findings are that the banks with a better IT, they also perform better and they can better meet the customer's digital service demand. And in terms of the PPP and deposits, uh, they find that uh, they perform better in terms of loan generation, both intensive and extensively. And they also see a higher deposit growth. So the main contribution from this paper first, obviously they provide a lot of new measurement of bank IT capacity. So which is, I think is very appreciated in the literature. And they also use this COVID-19 as IT demand shock. So they uh, have a good setting for that. And in terms of the uh, debate between bank and fintech, especially the rule of technology in the banking sector, they focus uh, uh, on the heterogeneity among banks' fintech adoption. So this is uh, a new perspective of they less studied in the literature. Okay. So overall, I think it's a very good paper. It has provided very timely and novel data. And as you can see, there's a lot of measurement work. And the authors have already shown many efforts to deal with indoctrinity and to uh, deal with those alternative stories. And I think the paper is very important to understand the impact of COVID-19 on the digitalization of banking industry. So a really good paper. And my, fo my following comments are basically on th uh, three folds. First, I will talk about empirical design and external validity. And then I will talk more about focus and highlights of the paper. Okay, first. As I said, uh, they have many three parts of the performance measurement. One is on the bank branch, one is on the deposit growth, and the other on the PVP loan. So uh, the first, uh, the bank branch and deposits, I will first talk about this one, because these two outcome variables, they are time variant. We can have time variant observations, and they are available before and after the pandemic shock. Right. So here the figure, uh, Ressa has already shown that, is the bank branch visits. Um, for those high and low IT bank branches before and after the shock. And, but in their regression, they do not do this thing like uh, distinguish between high and low and see before and after the shock. They just interact IT index with the uh, shock demand strength, uh, like the mobility restriction and uh, outbreaks. So, but in terms of the deposit growth here this, in this table, what they do is they interact IT index with the time. Basically it's before and after the shock, right? So I have a question is why does, uh, does not the author do like a deep in deep specification or event study for these two uh, performance for bank branch rates and deposits because they are time variant. And uh, maybe using a deep in deep specification that can also uh, lower down your guard for the indoctrinate concern for the IT index because pre-pandemic and this shock is unexpected, right? Unlike that, uh, on the PPP loan, this variable is, uh, I can understand the specification down by the authors. So in the current setting, it's cross-sectional. 
So they use this pre-pandemic bank IT to look at its impact on the PPP loan generation. And they use two IV for the bank IT. First one is they use this internet access, the other is a cyber attack. So I have one concern for the validity for those two IVs. One is for the internet access. I think it may correlate with PPP loans, not through this IT channel. Uh, for example, if the internet access in this county is stronger, it may be correlated with stronger online shopping behaviors and those SMEs, uh, like the uh, brick and the motor shops, they're more affected. So they may demand more PPP loans. So in that channel, it's not correlated. It's not a channel through this bank IT. And in terms of, of the cyber attack, um, so the authors see that more cyber attack indicates more riskness from IT adoption. And they indicate more IT adoption uh, or usage to deal with this cyber attack. But my question is, it is correlated with more or less IT because if I see more cyber attacks, I may feel it's not uh, safe to use so many ITs in my bank. And I may be uh, less likely to have a higher IT option. So this is uh, the point you can discuss more. And um, a more concerning point is their first stage of statistics is quite small. So I think this uh, IV variable might be problematic for you. And then uh, they study this banking switching like likelihood uh, using this PPP loan generation. One issue is it might be the selection bias. So we do not observe those, uh, especially those low IT banks that might exit. So this change of the relationship might be due to this selection bias. And the second problem is they use this uh, linear probability for this likelihood analysis. Um, but I think maybe a logic and, and a probit specification would be better. And um, in terms of the loan generation, I fully understand that this concern because they want to look at the loans and also deficits. But for the loans, I think the PPP loans might not be the best sample for the overall lending performance, especially when we talk about technology. Because the uh, function of FinTech um, maybe can include efficiency, inclusion, and credit evaluation, right? And I think many papers and so had, had already shown evidence that uh, the technology is used for, for uh, more efficient credit evaluation. So they can be better to identify those riskier borrowers and charge a proper, appropriate price for them. But for the PPP loans, they are government supported. So they have little risk consideration and it's not good for the performance evaluation. So uh, my suggestion like the, uh, what I said before, is my, you can make use of time variant, uh, total long growth, and also it's decomposition. Um, if the deficit data is available in the core report, this long data is, might also be there. And if that is the case, you can could also use a deep in deep specification. So in that way, uh, you can have an overall unified and uh, an analytic uh, framework. And second is uh, it must be possible to use steel scan data to look at the new landings, rule over landings and credit lines because they are quite different characteristics. And it might be useful if you focus the question on the loan generation from IT. And the last thing is about this uh, specification on this uh, dummy variable. I think you can use logic appropriate specification. And then my second major concern is about this external validity. So first one is there might be other players. Um, this paper focused on the comparison between high-end IT banks and low IT banks. That is quite good, I think. But there are also banks versus those uh, FinTech players. So these FinTech players could also be a confounder for, for the bank IT and better performance or more digital service in your case. If they have a substitution relationship, uh, real, real results could be underestimated. But if they are complementary uh, between FinTech and banks, your result might be overestimated. And the second validity concern is there about other theories. So uh, that bank IT have similar rules in those recessions without this IT demand shock, such as the global financial crisis. And I also wonder whether we'll survive in those tranquil times. So I just overall think whether this result is very specific to this COVID uh, period. And lastly, um, based on the current results, the author suggests that since the more IT, the better. So I wonder if there's any trade-off such as uh, when you adopt more IT, you may need to uh, incur higher costs for the banks. 
And uh, second, you can also think why those certain banks have higher IT to start and why those other banks do not. It's whether they are small, they do not have those uh, capacity to meet those higher costs to have those IT. So I think these questions may be on this paper, but I think it's worth defining and discussing briefly. And lastly, it's about the focus uh, of the risk questions. So as you can see from the presentation, it's already many, many results. Um, for the bank IT plus these mobility restrictions, the author generated results for uh, branch visits, web tra traffic, and more PPP lending and bank switching behaviors, more data days, more branch closure and IT upgrades, and many, many others. So I, I sometimes when I read the paper, I feel it might be too many. And especially because the authors use different data, different sample, different specifications in, the, in different parts. So I, I think it might be better to like, have a more focused and uh, highlight of the results. So for example, uh, when you look at the shock on the bank branches from the COVID, right? And the result is less branch visits, similar to the website traffic. So they are very good facts. Uh, and I really appreciate that. But I think also to put that as a main story because they have two sections for that part. And I may feel that that may be, uh, dilute or distract the readers from the main results on the lending and depot date part. So I would suggest to mitigate the emphasis on the branch and the website visit results and have more focus on the economic performance and then unify the empirical specification. And I have some minor comments. Uh, I think I do not have time for that and I'll conclude. So overall, I think it's a very nice contribution and to the discussion on the bank's digital service during COVID-19 crisis, they have new IT measurement and they have a multiple dimensions of performance results. And I really learned a lot from this paper and I encourage everyone to give it a read. It has already very reached out. I just think it could be even better with a more simplified and unified analytic framework and highlight results. And good luck with the paper. I will stop here, thank you. Okay, thanks. Uh, Sylvester, do you want to provide a brief answer to the discussion? Sure. And there are a few questions in the Q&A box and the chat. So maybe you can type the questions. We don't have yeah. time to go through it uh, because of time, yeah. Yeah, well, okay, well, so first of all, Thank you very much, Shane. That was a that was a great discussion. There was a lot of a lot of very good points. Uh, obviously, I don't have time to time to address all of that. But I mean, generally, you're absolutely right. I mean, we're a little bit like we we kind of started from started from the idea of and then started looking at what what is it that we can actually measure during this period in terms of data availability and it making some kind of sense. And then we've been kind of added some elements as as we found as data became available or we were able to do some things. So it's it is a little bit. Um, in that sense, there's a lot of lot of stuff in it, and that also, by virtue of the data coming from different sources and the structure of the data being different, inevitably, kind of the empirical specifications just have to be different because you cannot do exactly the same thing. It's because some somewhere like the, in the branch level data, we we you know we can measure at at the outlet level on a weekly basis. So there we can do these res local restrictions and these other things as a panel data set. You can't do that with the deposits at the bank level at the quarterly frequency because the, the restrictions variable doesn't mean anything on a quarterly level. That would be just one point in time. So, so that, that that's kind of why these specifications are inevitably a bit different for these different outcomes we look at. But it's true. I mean, it, we should, we should probably do a better job trying to make it less confusing for the reader because it's a bit uh, it is a bit hard to follow probably. Um, and I agree. I mean, the I, the the instruments we have. They're clearly not perfect. We're not claiming them to be perfect. They just what they do is essentially they, they force some additional structure to your your uh, opposition to some of the analysis. But of course, no, neither of these things are perfect instruments. These were the best we came up with. If you if you can think of better ones, we'd love to hear that as well. But it's of course it's hard to hard to come up with completely clean exogenous variation in something like IT, which by definition is obviously a conscious decision by the bank. Um, and yeah, on your on your other stuff, um, on maybe one thing on the PPP loans, I just want to say, so you're right, it's a bit unusual product. It doesn't have the same kind of credit risk necessarily as, as the typical loan products would have, although there's some debate maybe where there's some loan, some credit risk as well for the bank. But, um, but the, I think the one reason why it is a nice product for this kind of thing is 
it's a new loan product that didn't exist going into the crisis. It suddenly, it suddenly the banks had to put that together kind of on, on a kind of more or less overnight basis um, with much of their IT staff probably being working from home. So in some sense, it's kind of a nice stress test of how, how they're able to kind of add new stuff to their, their offering. But of course, it's a bit unusual product. So how, how externally valid it is, I don't know, but it's, you, you can argue either, either way, I think. And then on the fintech stuff, absolutely fair point. So we haven't looked at the substitution between fintech, basically due to other constraints, but, uh, but it's, we have thought about it and we, we might do it, but it might be a different paper. But you might think of this bank IT as a continuum and maybe the fintech is like an extended, then if you extend it from the high end, maybe that's then the fintech in some sense. Um, yeah, and maybe on, the, maybe on the couple of questions on the chat. So, um, yeah, bank, so, I, sorry, maybe you have yeah. to stop now, um, but you can try to answer it through the chat. Okay, I'll, I'll just write answers in the chat for the remaining yes. questions. Thank you very much. So we have to, yeah, thanks. Uh, also, thank you, Xiao, for the discussion. Um, so we move on to the third paper. So Professor Vives from IESC Business School will give a presentation. The floor is yours. You have 25 minutes. Okay. Uh, do you see the screen well? Yeah. Yes, yes, great. Okay, thank you. Okay, so this is... Um, Joint work with Ziki and uh, Ye also at uh, Yes Business School, and and let me uh, I will be quick in the introduction because in a sense the previous papers also serve as an introduction to this one, which is a theoretical uh, piece. Uh, as we know, no banks feel this increasing pressure no, from the threat of digitalization and digital entrance. Uh, this has some differences, no in emerging and developing markets and developed markets, but in any case, the technology is there and it is uh, felt. No? This is uh, transforming no? the reliance on physical branches to adopting information technology. We've seen it no, in, the, in, in the last uh, paper. And this uh, IT adoption in particular, uh, for example, makes the use of uh, big data and unconventional data like the digital footprints, no useful uh, to assess the quality of borrowers, uh, to offer personalized services and allows price discrimination. No? And the COVID pandemic accelerates all this process. Again, uh, in the, the, the previous paper is, um, is a good example. So the questions that we want to address are the following. Um, how do this development and diffusion no, of differential technology affect uh, and affect bank competition and bank stability. Not to say, are banks more or less stable? And what are the welfare uh, implications? Uh, to do so, we uh, build a, a special model uh, of competition in which uh, banks uh, compete. In fact, it will be a sell of uh, circular type uh, model. Banks compete to provide entrepreneurs um, with loans. Um, the special uh, analogy can be physical, but need not be physical. Could also be in characteristics space where banks are specialized in different sectors, uh, for example. Uh, the key ingredients of our model are that banks are differentiated by this deep expertise or localization uh, or specialization. Uh, they can uh, modulate monitoring and or screening, and I'll explain a little bit further in our model what is this, depending on the entrepreneur's location, so they can discriminate uh, on that, but also can try to discriminate on their loans according to the location of the entrepreneurs. Um, we see that information technology uh, can be of service in two different aspects. The first, by basically lowering the cost of monitoring or screening an entrepreneur without changing the bank's relative cost advantage in different locations. For example, you know, improving the processing of hard information. Or in a slightly more subtle way, it can weaken the influence of the bank borrower distance on monitoring or screening costs. Uh, for example, this is another example of this would be making easier the transformation of soft information into hard information. For example, no using these digital footprints, big data and machine learning techniques. Uh, in our basic version of the model, uh, we have a monitoring interpretation. The monitoring increases the probability of success 
of the projects of entrepreneurs, but also we could have a screening interpretation where the success probability of a finance project uh, really uh, depends on the screening of the bank. Um, and in a situation where we could think that even there is inverse selection where the, the bank or the, or the fintech knows more about the project, uh, the project probability of success than the very enterprise. In any case, in both cases, and in our model, there is a benefit for both the lender and the borrower or either the monitoring or the screen. Uh, so um, we will consider, in fact, in the, in the presentation uh, only monitoring, but keep in mind that the um, results also could uh, be applied to a screen. Uh, let me um, have some um, overview of the results. So the, the first result is if a bank uh, adopts uh, more advanced information technology, whatever its type of the two types I have mentioned before, then it can ask for higher loan range and is more stable. Uh, and this is consistent with the um, uh, available empirical uh, evidence. Also, uh, and furthermore, if um, there is an overall improvement in information technology, so for all participants in the market, big banks or fintechs, if uh, the bank's relative cost advantage is unaffected by this overall improvement, then bank's differentiation and competition intensity do not change, monitoring or screening become cheaper and banks are more stable. However, if the influence of bank borrower distance on monitoring or screening cost is weakened, the second type, if you want, of information technology uh, advantage, then bank's differentiation decreases, competition intensifies, and banks become less stable. And as a result of this, uh, the welfare effect of, internet, of um, IT progress, information technology progress, is ambiguous. Um, it's, there is a positive force in the sense that the monitoring or screening costs are uh, lower, but if and when bank competition is intensified, this may be either welfare improving or welfare reducing, depending on whether competition is insufficient or excessive to start. Uh, and finally, we find that if information technology is very advanced and in a sense it's quite cheap, then banks would endorse usually always choose very low levels of differentiation, which implies excessive competition. Okay, and so let's see if we have time to uh, go uh, over that. So the, um, the economy is, uh, as I promised, um, a salop type circle, a circle of city uh, with circumference uh, two, a point represents the characteristics of an entrepreneur, maybe type of project, technology, or physical location, if you want. And two close points mean that the entrepreneurs in these locations are sick. Entrepreneurs types are distributed uniformly along the circumference. And at each point uh, in the circle, there is a potential mass M of entrepreneurs. Two banks are located at the end points of the diameter of the city and raise funds from depositors and provide loans to the entrepreneurs. Banks, therefore, are closer uh, to some entrepreneurs than uh, to others, so they have kind of somehow uh, natural market areas. Uh, and the uh, main example with banks, for example, specialize in different sectors. Now, if the distance between entrepreneur and bank one is Z, then we say that this entrepreneur is located at Z. Okay, so this is just a, a stylized representation of uh, the situation. Now, uh, what are the projects? Well, each entrepreneur has no initial capital, but can, by, uh, can entertain a risky project, requires a, a unit of thought. Uh, banks cannot invest directly in real projects, but can lend to entrepreneurs. And then the investment project of an entrepreneur at Z, at location Z, yields a return R positive with, posit with probability MZ and zero with a complementary probability where the MZ is the bank monitoring index. So it's an extremely simplified model. Then if an entrepreneur at Z borrows at a certain loan rate RZ, she derives utility, uh, which is just basically the expected uh, return minus a, um, uh, if you want a, a, a base or, or a minimum uh, opportunity cost or level of opportunity but that has to be uh, overcome for the entrepreneur to, um, uh, to undertake the project. And then for each entrepreneur at Z, 
that you uh, lower bodies um, independently are uniformly distributed on zero M, where M is the total mass of, of entrepreneurs in, in this location. Uh, projects of entrepreneurs are correlated, are fully correlated. That's another simplifying assumption. Uh, and then the project of an entrepreneur at location Z under certain monitoring intensity MZ fails if and only if this uniformly distributed uh, zero one random variable uh, zeta is less than one minus MZ, okay? Consistently uh, with what we have here. Uh, banks deposits. Uh, banks obtain uh, funds uh, from deposits, which are the ultimate lenders. Uh, those deposits are perfectly elastic at least three rate uh, F. Um, in the base model, banks deposit are not insured, but depositors in, uh, in this base model are sophisticated and observe bank risks. And this uh, guarantees that the bank's expected marginal funding cost is F, no matter how the bank chooses its monitoring intensity. Uh, we could also alternatively think uh, that um, deposits are fully insured, but with fair uh, premiums for deposit insurance, and it would be exactly uh, the same as in our case. Now, a monitoring and information technology is that the other ingredient, a key ingredient of our model. Um, a bank I, by monitoring an entrepreneur at Z with a certain intensity, MI, incurs a non pecuniary cost, which is quadratic in the intensity, and it is pre-multiplied by this uh, factor. Uh, then uh, this factor, there are two or three key ingredients, CI, QI, SI. SI is the location, Z with respect to one, one minus Z with respect to bank two. QI is the weight of the location, in the sense it measures the influence of bank borrower distance on monitoring costs, lowering QI, its information technology progress, that lessens the importance of distance. And CI is a more general information technology uh, parameter that captures how costly is bank monitoring uh, in general that can be lower uh, uniform. Uh, this cost function uh, has the following property, which is basically our results would also follow with, uh, with a more general cost function in which for a symmetric uh, C's and Q's so for symmetric banks, uh, this uh, general uh, cost parameter C does not affect the cost ratios, which is the relative cost advantage of one bank or the other. Uh, and uh, there is um, complementarity between the distance uh, from the bank and the queue and the importance of um, and the importance of, of distance according to the information technology uh, that is present in the bank. Okay, the timeline is the following, banks post loan rates, the entrepreneurs decide whether to implement their projects and which bank to approach. Then the banks choose the monitoring intensity, deposits put money in the banks and the nominal uh, deposit rate is set. The important thing uh, is that the loan rates are discriminatory loan rates by location. So they are, these are loan rates scaled. Okay, and also monitoring intensity is contingent on location. That, that's the important thing to uh, keep in mind. Okay, so uh, let's describe how would uh, an equilibrium with direct bank competition, which is our main focus, that's to say banks do not have local monopolies, but they interact. Um, then uh, this means that all locations are served, all the market uh, is served. And this is an expression for the bank expected profit of financing an entrepreneur at Z, uh, which is the return minus the monitoring cost minus uh, the expected cost of funding. Uh, the important thing to understand the logic of the model is that there is localized per trend competition between banks at this location. It's like a contest uh, between the two banks to serve the location. So if a bank captures the location, captures the location and captures all the customers in this location. Uh, the uh, bank's monitoring um, intensity for an entrepreneur at, at, at Z um, is positively related to the loan rate it can charge to the entrepreneur and negatively related to the cost parameters C1 and Q1, where Z is the distance from the entrepreneur to the bank. Okay. Now, 
Uh, an important concept in our competition is the following, is the concept of the best long ray, the bad guy can offer to an entrepreneur Z at, lo at location Z. Is uh, the long ray that maximizes the entrepreneur's expected utility and ensures the bank a non-negative profit. So it's the, the best, really, the bank can give the entrepreneur without losing money. Okay, and the monopoly loan rate is the monopoly loan rate. Okay, um, in our mo in our simple model, a bank best loan rate is just the the return on the project divided by two, and then a bank to win the contest at Z must consider the following. This R1Z must be more attractive than the best long rate that bank two can offer to win the contest. And subject to one, it has to be as high as possible, but not above the monopoly. Okay, so because then it means that there is no effective competition if it, by charging the monopoly, uh, the bank is home. Okay, so then uh, the, this proposition characterizes the, uh, the competitive uh, rates, which depend on the cost parameters and the um, uh, and the locations and X tilde uh, represents the market area uh, served uh, by the bank, by bank one. Okay. Um, so uh, in this, uh, when this X tilde would have an interior solution, entrepreneurs located in, in the market area uh, uh, of bank one are served by this uh, bank, by the others are served by uh, bank two, and the loan rate schedules are just the minimum of uh, the constraint or the competitive rate and the monopoly rate. Okay, so because you will never go above uh, the monopoly uh, rate. Uh, this X tilde is, um, so this uh, market area of bank one is decreasing in the cost parameters, okay, not uh, surprisingly, uh, the monitoring cost parameters of the bank. And so this means that by lowering those banks, uh, once lending is extended is extended, okay? So uh, if better information technology lower uh, uh, those, the bank uh, lending is extended. So this is consistent uh, with uh, results by, uh, Aner, uh, uh, by Aner et al. And in fact, also uh, it is consistent uh, with the results in the previous uh, paper uh, where um, you, you show more uh, PPPs, uh, loans for, uh, no, for um, uh, for better um, IT uh, banks. And not only that, but also according to this uh, figure where this Z is the location and this is the equilibrium uh, loan rate, uh, this would be like the, the middle uh, of the market. We see that the loan rates, um, uh, which are posted by the banks, instead of increasing with distance because uh, monitoring is more costly, they are decreasing with distance because to face the competition of the other bank. Okay, so this means that in regions like in here in the middle of the market where there is more competition, there is more volume of lending. Okay, so this again is consistent uh, with what uh, we have seen before. A second result is that these loan rates um, are decreasing in the, um, uh, in the costs because this uh, makes uh, the banks um, less competitive and increasing uh, in the costs of the, of the rivals, okay? So a higher C1 or Q1, uh, cost parameters for monitoring, uh, decreases the bank, bank one's competitive advantage and so induces the bank to decrease its loan rate to try to maintain market share, okay? Bank one this way faces less competitive pressure from bank two as uh, this bank two is less efficient uh, in, uh, in monitoring, and this again is consistent with the evidence in the mortgage market by Bushak. Uh, what happens in a symmetric situation uh, where the banks have symmetric uh, technologies, then, and with effective bank competition for allocation, then we find, interestingly, that the uh, competitive rate is increasing in Q, but not affected by C. So it's increasing in the uh, parameter that denotes the importance of distance. And uh, why is this so? Because decreasing Q, say, because of better information technology, decreases bank differentiation. And so competition intensifies. Okay, and so this is a key uh, insight uh, from our result. And then this proposition uh, it would hold also for the general cost function with the properties I have uh, mentioned uh, before. 
Um, okay. Then in terms of bank stability, we find that bank stability is inversely measured by its probability uh, of default. And we see that increasing the Q because, um, um, well, makes uh, 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 the bank uh, less efficient, okay? And, and increases the probability um, uh, of default while uh, the other C2 and Q2 of the rival uh, is, the, uh, is the opposite. And this is consistent with the, also with the work uh, of uh, Thierry and, and Timmer on, on stability, which I don't have time to show you. Now, uh, with um, a symmetric uh, uh, technologies, uh, we can analyze how IT progress of the entire banking sector affects stability. And here we, we find something which, uh, which is quite interesting, we think, which is that if this is a uniform, um, uh, in, this, in this case, in bettering of the information technology, that to say decreasing C, it decreases the probability of default. But if you decrease Q, which is what affects uh, the importance of distance, you increase the probability uh, of default because there are two effects. A cost saving effect, which would be good, like in here, but in fact, the differentiation effect, uh, which is dominant, um, uh, makes the banks less stable, okay, because uh, competition intensifies. Now, uh, this suggests to compare uh, competitive rates with what would a planner uh, would like the banks to set, and this we can do in terms of uh, second best rates or first best rates. For a second best rate, is the one where the planner cannot control uh, the monitoring intensity. So the monitoring intensity is decided by the bank, but it can control the rate. And then here, what we see, uh, and just to, uh, uh, to go uh, quickly, uh, what we see that um, when Q is small enough, so uh, when information technology is pretty good and distance uh, does not matter much, then always we have that the competitive rate is too low. That's to say, is below the uh, uh, the second best, uh, obviously the uh, the monopoly. These are not really flat with Q, uh, slightly uh, upwards. Um, so this is so uh, for the second best, and also uh, the same uh, holds uh, for the first best. So in here we have Q, and here we have Z. So the uh, the location, and then we see that as Q decreases we go from too high rates, uh, according to the second best, to too low rates, according to the second best, and even to too low rates, according to the first best. And the first best is where uh, the planner uh, or the regulator can also control the monitoring intensity. So it decouples uh, rates and monitoring uh, intensity, okay? So this has an implication uh, for social uh, welfare, uh, which is that, uh, uh, Q equals zero, uh, which would be the most efficient monitoring, is not uh, typically uh, the welfare optimum because there is excessive competition. And so it's home shaped. Okay. Uh, total welfare is home shaped and there is some positive Q uh, which maximizes uh, welfare. Finally, I, and with this I will, um, I will end. Uh, what about if the technology is chosen endogenous? Uh, which uh, makes a sense. Well, here, uh, what we find is that if um, the technology is pretty cheap, is relatively cheap, always the, uh, the, um, uh, the tendency will be for the banks uh, to choose the lowest possible queue. And this is like a, a prisoner start dilemma where the banks will be better off by trying to push queue a little bit higher to relax differentiation. But in fact, is the individual incentive is to, uh, to gain market share is to, um, is to reduce uh, Q. And then what happens is that obviously in this situation obvious, uh, will always be in an excessive competition uh, area. Okay, so from the welfare point of view, there would be uh, too much competition. So I conclude, um, the, uh, uh, we, we found that a technologically more advanced bank commands um, greater market power and so it's more stable. Uh, that uh, the effect of this IT progress depends on how it affects monitoring and screening and therefore bank differentiation. If bank differentiation is not affected, then uh, uh, technological progress is always good. 
Otherwise, we have an ambiguous uh, result, okay? And in fact, if a technology, uh, we think it's endogenous and cheap enough, uh, then we'll always have excessive competition. That's to say, there will be, um, in a sense, a excessive use uh, of the information uh, technology. This does not happen if banks do not compete directly if they have uh, local monopolies. So thank you, I leave it here. Great, thanks a lot. Uh, we have uh, Tony Arnold uh, from the Bank of Canada as this cousin. Tony, you have uh, at most 10 minutes. The floor is yours. Great, I'm trying to share my slides. Let's see how that works. Oh, here we are. Can we you can see, see the slides? Yeah, perfect. So thank you. Thank you to the organizers for asking me to discuss this very interesting uh, paper. These are my own views. So let me uh, start by, by looking at the motivation of the paper. So I, I think the authors are after a first order issue, an issue of first order importance, namely the digital revolution in banking. And it, fits very nicely into the session and, and with the other papers. You know, the, the, the buzzwords here are fintechs and big techs, kind of new information technology and automation technologies that are available to intermediaries. And IT allows banks um, to potentially offer more personalized services and uh, to price discriminate as well. And we will get back to this price discrimination in, in the model in a bit. So the main research question of the paper is to study how the development and diffusion of IT affects uh, bank competition. And the, the scope of the paper is, is uh, comprehensive. They look at a set of positive and normative implications. In particular, they look at the impact on lending rates and lending volumes and the impact on bank stability. And on the normative side, they look uh, on the impact uh, on uh, welfare and uh, efficient loan rates according to both first best and second best uh, criteria. Let me very briefly uh, summarize the model. So there are two banks uh, located on a salop circle competing for entrepreneurs that are uniformly distributed uh, uh, around the circle with some locations set. The loan rate that each bank I offers is location specific. So you can um, discriminate based on the location. The projects of entrepreneurs, which require funding from the bank. So the, the first function of the bank in this model is to offer funding to entrepreneurs is risky and can be either C or R and according to this um, single common factor, there is a perfect correlation of that risk. Monitoring on the extension with screening, but I'll, I'll use monitoring throughout the discussion for simplicity, then improves the success probability of this project. So a key assumption, just to make uh, clear to the audience here, is that monitoring effort is observable. So we don't have asymmetric information problem as in some other papers that look at uh, monitoring intensity of, of banks. The payoff to the entrepreneur is the probability of success given by the monitoring intensity um, times what the entrepreneur keeps. That's the return of, on the project. So I assume you, you see my mouse. So that's the capital R you get, uh, the entrepreneur gets on the project minus the loan rate paid to the bank minus some uh, outside option, which at each location uh, is drawn from this uniform distribution. And I'll come back to the, to the outside option later. So that's important for endogenously pinning down the lending volume. And then on the funding side of banks, um, it's very standard. Banks are funded with uninsured deposits that have a required return of F. So the critical 
component in the model is this cost of monitoring function. So there's, it's quadratic in monitoring intensity M and the key aspects here are these cost coefficient C and Q. So C is a general measure of monitoring costs. So for example, uh, C would go down if it were cheaper for a bank to use hard information, such as um, verifying collateral, um, verifying the existence of collateral, finding out its price and, and com communicating that information. As we have argued in uh, that honored at um, I paper that the authors cite. Since S either takes the value Z or one minus Z, depending on whether it's bank one or two, Q is a measure for the wall of distance. So for example, Q goes down when some soft information is hardened or when the bank is organized in a better way such that distance becomes less important. So in, in a way you can think about this as, you know, um, kind of hard information stories and this as soft information stories. And then just the timing of the model, banks first post their loan rate schedules. Entrepreneurs choose whether to be active or not. If they're not active, then they just get their outside option, um, you lower bar. And then if active, they decide uh, to which bank uh, to go to. Bank chooses observable monitoring and then bank uh, raises funding. So a, a, a quick comment. So this paper follows uh, this uh, this kind of more recent literature where whereby kind of lending occurs first and then the bank gets funding, which is different from kind of the um, loanable funds literature where you have the funds first and and then uh, lend out loans. And some people, especially kind of in the macro banking literature, have recently argued that this sort of timing where you get the loans first and then a look for funding is, is more appropriate. Okay, let me very quickly uh, talk about uh, some of the results. So the optimal monitoring in, in intensity increases in the loan rate because that's what the, the bank uh, gets uh, when it succeeds and therefore it has higher incentives to, to monitor. And uh, the following two lemmas characterize the best loan rate for entrepreneurs and the monopoly loan rate. And I just wanna highlight an interesting intuition, a lower loan rate may be bad news for the entrepreneur. So the entrepreneur may, pref may not prefer a reduction in the loan rate because this lower loan rate, as I've just said, is tied to the monitoring intensity. And um, an important uh, ingredient for this result is that uh, monitoring is, is observable. So hence, I focus on the arguably more interesting case on, on direct competition, given the paper's focus. And proposition one pins down these equilibrium loan rates and we have this threshold location X tilde whereby below X to the bank one serves entrepreneurs and above X to the bank two serves entrepreneurs. And an interesting intuition, which we also see in other literatures is that bank exerts competitive pressure, even when it's not serving uh, entrepreneur at a given location, just kind of the existence and the threat of serving them at, at a certain price um, leads to a competitive pressure. And as information technology develops a reduction in, in either of these cost coefficients, bank one serves entrepreneurs uh, further away. And as argued, that's uh, consistent with the evidence we find for a small business lending uh, of IT banks. We have three more minutes. Um, Okay, then there are more results on um, IT adoption uh, from the perspective of one bank keeping cost coefficients uh, constant for the other banks consistent with evidence. Um, and let me kind of skip that so I'll have time uh, to get comments. So overall, I'm very impressed by this paper. So I think it uh, is on an important and timely question. It's an impressive piece uh, of microeconomics of banking. I very much enjoyed reading it. it it has a careful uh, analysis that many it has many implications, both positive and normative, 
and it links to various pieces uh, of empirical literature. So it kind of made my job very hard. I'm, I'm trying to um, suggest three comments that may be helpful to the authors. So the first one, and which is, was partially addressed by this final result that Xavier showed us, is uh, to kind of push more in the direction of choosing IT development or adoption. So for most of the paper, um, it, uh, it looks at comparative statics with respect to C and Q, these cost coefficients in the uh, cost function of monitoring. So it would be nice to systemically study the choice of IT adoption by banks. So for example, what's their uh, privately optimal choice and how it uh, contrasts with the social optimum. We could think about would it uh, only choose um, to improve the soft information part? Would it only choose to improve the hard information part or a combination of both? So I understand that a bit more work uh, would be required, but one could work with exogenous cost functions for uh, IT adoption and then just use the endogenous benefit that, that comes out of uh, the model. So the there's already one result in the paper that says when it uh, when only Q can be chosen and it's costless to do so, then the private optimum is uh, Q equals zero, which is um, lower than the social optimum. But I think may maybe one of the authors can do more to characterize kind of the optimal choice of both uh, Q and C simultaneously. So one conjecture I had that improving hard information can become uh, socially wasteful because as Xavier has shown, it doesn't affect um, competition. It would still reduce uh, um, uh, monitoring costs, but if adopting um, kind of uh, uh, better hard information technology, basically lowering C, then this cost uh, might dominate. So overall, I would encourage the authors to kind of push in this direction more systematically uh, studying the choice of IT adoption for both Q and, and C uh, simultaneously. The second comment is that a set of uh, results are only available numerical, especially for the case of direct competition. So it's also the results on bank stability and the results on welfare. And it would be nice if analytical results could be derived that would make the paper even stronger. And I understand that it gets very complicated. So my, my third result is, oh my, sorry, my third comment is, I was thinking about can the model be simplified maybe in order to push further along comments one and two. So I don't think there's scope in terms of uh, monitoring and the funding side, but uh, that's already as simple as possible with observable monitoring and uninsured deposits. One idea I had was, uh, could the outside option of entrepreneurs be simplified? So in particular, I was wondering if one sets U lower bar equals zero for all entrepreneurs at a given location, would that help? So that would obviously abstract from the participation of entrepreneurs and the authors would presumably lose their results on the volume of lending, but that could gain a significant simplification, for example, when calculating the default rate theta in lemma four. Also, I thought whether they would lose something on the welfare implications, so one of the terms in the social welfare function in equation six would drop, but there's still a trade-off of benefits and costs. So it, it seemed to me uh, that they wouldn't lose anything on that dimension. So I would encourage the authors to check whether that's, a, that's a, a useful simplification. And maybe it would allow them to push further on these other two dimensions. Overall, let me wrap up. I think it's a, a paper on an important question that is very well executed and I tremendously enjoyed reading it and I'll recommend it to all of you. Thanks a lot, Tony, for the uh, great discussion. Uh, before we give Xavier an uh, um, opportunity to uh, briefly respond, maybe two more small questions. If you could uh, perhaps speculate on the robustness of the results when you consider a bank entry. Um, and uh, another aspect that uh, came up a lot in the FinTech discussion is this uh, um, distinction between this dimension, you have cheaper IT versus uh, more access to larger troves of data. And, uh, you know, uh, data access might be exclusive and that might be a little bit like a local monopoly. So I'm wondering whether it can be sort of captured within your modeling framework in the queues 
or maybe one needs to think about that differently. Okay, uh, thank you, thank you very much for the um, uh, for the comments. Um, uh, on the uh, 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 comments by by Tony, I think they're all well uh, well taken. So are things to think about and to try to extend it. Although the paper is getting longer, so I'm getting worried that they are uh, that that then we'll have to cut too much. Okay, but but in any case, they're all good, uh, all very good suggestions. Uh, just one thing. Um, one comment on, on one thing you said is that the fact that in our model effort is observable is crucial only if deposits are uninsured. But with uh, fairly priced deposit insurance, then we, we, we do not need this assumption. So we have these two polar cases, like uh, no um, uninsured and full insured, but fairly priced. Okay, so that's the only uh, comment on what you said. Uh, then on, on the robustness, uh, bank entry. Yeah, this is. I think. In fact, we, we are working on a second paper uh, looking exactly at this question, at the entry question, and uh, we do not have anything to report yet. But we hopefully we can be able to say something uh, soon. Um, then on, on the other question, uh, this I'm not completely sure. Um, um, I think it's an important issue um, whether this data exclusivity you not know, can generate into kind of some local monopoly. And I, this, I think, is a very important um, insight in particular because now some kind of big techs you know, can be thought as gatekeepers you know, and, and, and controlling, you know, uh, um, and controlling uh, data. And, and, and this is something to uh, uh, to, uh, to think about. Uh, okay, so I think it's, it's a good suggestion, but again, to to further thinking and, and maybe to um, to rationalize uh, microfound a little bit more, no, the local monopoly uh, situation would be like local platform monopoly, right, or something like that. So thank you very much. I, I think very good uh, comments that will put for thought. Okay, great. Uh, time has come to an end. Sorry for taking a bit longer. Uh, this has been a very interesting session and there was a lot to learn for me and for sure for many of you. Uh, we would like to thank all participants and express a, a special thank to our presenters and the discussants who did great work. Um, enjoy the uh, rest of the uh, CIPRA conference. Bye-bye. Uh, Bye-bye. Thank you. Bye-bye. Thank you. Bye-bye. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. Thank you. Bye-bye. Thank you. Thank you.